Harper to get it in. Throws it to Ewing. Ewing surrounded. Two seconds to shoot. He drives. He shoots. He missed. He missed. He missed. We were in the bell, baby. Ding dong. The witch is dead. Takes the ball at the 30. He's hit and got away. Back up field at the 35 to the 40. He's in the 45. He's the Hawk Talk. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Hawk Talk with Easy and the Beards. I'm Easy. I am beard number one. And I am beard number two. We have a special guest today, um, UNCW men's soccer coach, Aiden Haney. Thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure, guys. Thanks for, for finally getting here. We try to do it in the fall, but it's, uh, we're here now in the spring. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of, kind of a good time, too. I know you guys got your spring season coming up, yeah. finished last season, um, had some kids drafted, so we'll probably get into a lot of that, but... Um, we kind of like to just take a little bit of a deep dive into just the background of most of our uh, guests we have, coaches, players, etc. And uh, kind of maybe just start, I know you're born across the pond in Newcastle, right. England. Yes. So tell me a little bit about just growing up over there, about how long were you in England until you came to the States? Yeah, I had a bit of a um, interesting upbringing, should I say. My, um, I was born and raised in, in Newcastle. Um, I'm sure everyone is familiar with Newcastle United, if not Newcastle United, Newcastle Beer, Newcastle Brown Ale. So, um, but yeah, I was born and raised there to Irish parents, so um, kind of an interesting uh, or different path really, because my parents, uh, we ended up living in Africa for four years. We lived in, um, I was in South Africa when I was about six, and then uh, Zimbabwe uh, for two years when I was about uh, 11, 12. <clears throat> um, yeah, and then came back to, to to Newcastle from there and, and um, ended up you know, graduating high school and I was with Newcastle United as a, as a youth. I was playing for the youth team at a couple of reserve games and um, I was offered a contract with them which I signed at 16. Uh, I lasted three months. I was just not ready for pro soccer and uh, ended up with my tail between my legs going back to, to, to school for two more years uh, to 18 and then had some other opportunities with some pro clubs and I was offered a pro contract with Norwich. And um, I just decided education and, and playing soccer and coming to the States was kind of the way to go. So came over on a soccer scholarship to UNC Charlotte and kind of that's how I ended up in, in America back in 1988, many, many moons ago. So what kind of, I know obviously over in Europe, soccer is more of the sport really. Yeah. So what... What kind of got you into soccer when you were younger? <clears throat> was it something that was just came natural and was all around you growing up? So you just yeah. kind of picked it up. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's it was the one sport that that everybody played, and everyone, you know, uh, would would kick around with your, your mates and playing in the park and out in the backyard. We had a backyard. I had uh, two older brothers, and uh, basically, I get thrown in goal, and they'd be shooting on me, and you know, we had imagine a, a grass, you know, backyard, and literally. A, uh, some goalposts and no, it's just dirt because we were out there all the time. So, so I was kind of you know the kid who went in goal, and and that was ended up being my position because I probably spent a lot of time there. You know, just and, uh, the youngest gets stuck in goal. Youngest so. one gets put in goal, and um, so that was kind of how it started. But you know, I played some other sports. Actually, going to Africa was very good for me because I almost took like a two-year hiatus, especially the second part when I was a little bit older, and there was no soccer in the school. I went to a boarding school in the middle of the bush and. You know, the water polo, cricket, rugby, uh, all these sports that I'd never experienced before. And, and I played a little bit of rugby when I was growing up in England. But um, So th I think those were really good for my development in, in certain ways. So what was uh, the trip to Africa? That probably for a young kid like yourself at that time, was that kind of an eye-opening experience? What was that like being from mm -hmm. England and then it was to it, Yeah, it was a real, real shock to the system, to be honest. I mean, it was literally... You know, landed in, in uh, we lived in a place called Hawange, uh, which was, if anyone's heard of Victoria Falls, um, it's one of the wonders of the world, it's beautiful, uh, but it was about an hour from there, and within two weeks getting shipped off to the middle of nowhere to a remote um, school, you know, and it was it was, it was was tough, and uh, it was a very tough school, and to be honest with you, probably one of the really formative uh, periods of my life, because it changed, a, you know, it gave me a lot of discipline, respect, um, having to having to deal with some of the things I had to deal with at a boarding school with no no mom or dad to make sure you uh, do your laundry and do what you had to do. So so definitely probably helped shape who you are to this day. Absolutely. Yeah, very much so. So what was the recruiting process like then, back then? I know you ended up then going to UNC Charlotte, like you said, back in the late 80s. 
what was that recruiting process like? I find that like, I, I feel like it was a lot tougher back then to get seen by a, an American university. Very much so, yeah. You, I mean, there's no internet and, yeah. and, and uh, you know, it wasn't like we had mobile phones and FaceTime and those sorts of things. But uh, yeah, it was interesting. I, I, um, I was, it was, you know, I'd, I'd, when, I'd, when I left Newcastle United and, and had that experience and, you know, had a, had a rough experience going back to school, um, I did send some letters over to the States, you know, to some, some um, there was a teacher that I knew and he had some contacts and reached out to some schools like Stanford, Duke, South Carolina, they were their big programs. And got one, only one team uh, responded and it was, it was Stanford and, you know, they had just finished their recruiting class. So it ended up, I was very lucky, there was a, a, a player playing at UNC Charlotte from my city and uh, they were looking for a, a, um, a centre back, a uh, defender and the coach came over and, and watched our team play. We were playing for the equivalent of the state team and ended up, uh, he kind of picked me out and I ended up, instead of getting a centre back, he ended up you know, recruiting a goalkeeper. So that's how I ended up going to UNC Charlotte. It was uh, quite, quite fortuitous. So then, when you come over then to UNC Charlotte, that's your first, is that your first experience then in America? Never been before. It was uh, I didn't know what a GPA was. I didn't know what a, a credit hour. I didn't know what the NCA was. I was completely oblivious to, to what it was all about. And um, I remember my first semester. I ended up um, you know it was late on when I got recruited. So you know taking um, political science and then history of rock and roll was quite you know it was quite a shock to, to or quite an interesting start. You know. Um, but you, yeah, I mean, again, and I was 18, skinny, freckled, bespectacled, bespectacled uh, freshman coming in. These guys like, who's, who's this kid? He, surely he can't play. He can't, he can't be very good. And uh, thankfully, I got off to a good start, and kind of that was the start of the, the, the ball rolling for me. What were some things that kind of stand out to you from that initial American? I guess, experience when you first got here? What are some things that kind of stand out? Uh, one, the heat. Um, you know, I came in July. I actually came over early for a preseason, started in August, and, um, you know, I was able to get a job on campus, and I was writing tickets, which, if you, if, if you guys have ever had that kind of job, but I literally was living in fear because I'd write a ticket, <laughs> slap it on the windshield, then kind of t hightail it out of there, <laughs> yeah. you know. And, uh, but, yeah, and, no, I, the, the, honestly, the heat was the, the biggest factor right out of the gates, but, honestly, the... the Everyone was so welcoming. Everyone was so friendly, and, and um, you know I, I, that was my initial. You know it was it was a tough transition because you know it was again being on your own. There wasn't the ability to, to have connections with your, your your family like you have now. But um, if you're if you're overseas, but you know you just adapt, don't you? And um, but yeah, I, I kind of fell I really fell in love with being able to study, uh, being able to play. You know on a, on a sport and we. We were kind of at a time when UNC Charlotte hadn't been doing too well, and we had a really good recruiting class. So we started making some real improvements, and by the by, my senior year, you know, we were a top team. Yeah, and then kind of leading into then that first appearance for the university in the NCAA tournament, mm -hmm. you were then a part of. Yeah. What was that kind of? Obviously, like you said, you were part of kind of this class coming in that eventually gained the university some success mm -hmm. but prior to that were you kind of there as a freshman you guys weren't very good and then kind of it led up to then being in the tournament your senior year yeah it was it was it was uh, the, the, the coach who brought me in left and started the program at Creighton after the first year um, and we were I think we were like nine and something we, we you know again I played a lot of minutes um, sophomore year we brought in a new coach and that was a completely different experience um, very much about fitness and running and um, so there was a bit of an adjustment period the second year and then third and fourth year, you know, I think we ended up with third in the nation by the time the season ended, um, you know, but there were some really good players. I put that down to the coach who recruited in some very, very talented guys and, and uh, yeah, it came together. It was, it was, it was fun. It was, you know, back in the, you know, pep rally to go to the NCAA tournament and, and, you know, it was, you know, letter jacket and, you know, there's all this Americana stuff that yeah. I was, I was not used to and I thought it was great. Yeah. So that was something you definitely enjoyed absolutely yeah, yeah. that yeah. experience for sure for sure i mean i don't know how many people who wouldn't but um it was definitely almost uh, like watching a movie you know and you're in it for sure as you got to be an upperclassman then you mm -hmm. know you talked about enjoying your studies obviously you had success uh, on the athletic field as well you know what was going through your head as you started approaching you know the end of your career there at unc charlotte yeah, there was no MLS at the time. Um, I, I still wanted to play. You know, I'd, I'd taken a coaching course when I was 17 in England. Um, I just loved 
the sport. But I, when I was in college, I was a very I was a serious student. I worked hard and because I, I thought I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to stay in the country, and um, so I was very you know kind of conscious of making sure I did well in the classroom. But uh, yeah, towards the end, it was I, I knew I wanted to play, and, and um, we went on a, an end of season tour to uh, Germany. Um, um, with the team we went over there and we actually uh, four of us ended up getting signed for for uh, a team over in the uh, third division SV Wiesbaden and uh, I ended up coming back early um, in my end of my junior year actually the reason I was able to stay I actually applied for a, a lottery pick for a green card and my number got picked so somebody was looking after me um, and so I ended up you know going through that process and and that was kind of the way I was able to stay and, and, and um, you know, remain in the States and it was a green card through a, a pure pure lottery pick. Um, so I came back and it was when this league was starting, uh, it's called USISL before MLS and I uh, got in with a team in Greensboro and we put that group together and that was a lot of North Carolina, UNCG, UNC Charlotte, uh, Duke, Carolina guys and uh, it was it was it was good times. So was that basically the only level of soccer professionally in it the was, States yeah. at that point in mm -hmm. time? Yeah. There was, a, there was this league called the A-League, and there was the USISL. The A-League had maybe eight teams in it, and that ended up folding, and ours was kind of like the, you know, some really, uh, some, some names that played in there, you know, the Tony Miolas, uh, you know, Chris Armises, people like that who ended up playing on the, on the national team. It was, uh, so we were, uh, I think we, we won the league two years in a row. We, we beat... Um, uh, Minnesota, uh, Orlando Lions, and we beat Minnesota in the second year in the finals. So um, yeah, it was it was, uh, and again, with good support in the Greensboro area, North Carolina was the you know, fans were willing to come out and watch games. Like you said, it is kind of a hotbed of soccer here in the states. You know, this <coughs> Carolina's region, and I'm sure you probably had no idea when you came over the for the very first time, but you probably played against a, some high quality competition mm -hmm. against the UNCs and whatnot, and now you're playing with them professionally. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, I was. And, and, you know, we didn't know how many, you know, the youth set up and how that was going to be. But, but certainly, I mean, you got, you know, the, the, the highest level probably, you know, besides, me, you know, us in California, North Carolina's got the most universities of, of high level uh, Division One soccer. And then, so did you start uh, getting into coaching a little bit at, at this time as well? Yeah, even when I was in college, I was, I was a goalkeeper, so I trained goalkeepers and then I would, you know, there was a local club, and I would I'd fill in and you know, as, as a coach from time to time, and um, so yeah, that was always something I kept I kept on doing and and, um, and enjoyed, um, and uh, yeah, it was it was something I was continually, you know, keep, keep my toe in. And was was it about this time you got like your first official coaching position at UNC? Yeah, well, I was playing with the Dynamo, and actually ended up training goalkeepers. So I was um, when I was living in Greensboro, I was. I would travel to UNC uh, men, Duke women, and UNCG men. I basically was almost like a, a traveling Routine. goalkeeper, goalkeeper coach, and I was doing that. And after a season with Carolina, uh, the coach offered, uh, asked if I would be interested in being his assistant at UNC, and um, so that's what I, I ended up taking up that that opportunity at Carolina. So I was there, I was there for a year, um, still playing kind of in the summers for for the Dynamo. Um, and while I was while I was actually on staff, I got asked to go down for preseason with New England Revolution, um, and that was kind of how it started. Where I got an opportunity to play in MLS, and um, pretty funny story. I was I was um, went down, played a, with a week down there, uh, played a couple of games, and then they needed a goalkeeper for the opening weekend to sit on the bench because they had drafted someone. He wasn't uh, he was playing indoor. Go down to play at the the old Tampa Sombrero. You know, the old Tampa Bowl. Um, I played against Tampa Bay Mutiny and it was about 90th minute of the game and the goalkeeper gets sent off. So I'm in with like a minute left to play. But then, you know, referee blows the whistle after the game. The, the you know, GM is like, hey, listen, can you play up? We're playing in the Giant Stadium next Friday or Saturday. We're playing the Metro Stars. Can you play? So I have to go back to Carolina and ask my boss, you, you know, can I, is this okay if I can do this? I said, yeah, sure. I go up to Giant Stadium and in front of 68,000 fans and, you know, we win 1-0. Can you play the next week up in Boston? And, you know, that was kind of my boss was like, oh, listen, they need to make a decision. So I ended up signing a contract with, with MLS and, and uh, played for New England Revolution. Was, was that their first year? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was. It was uh, yeah, there was the MLS first year as yes. well, right? Okay. And then, so, I don't know how true this is, but obviously you can verify this. For the longest time... You held the record for the fastest red card and no comment. 
I did, yeah, yeah. Yes. That's not a claim to fame I want to have, but yeah, okay. I did feel it. <laughs> thankfully, uh, thankfully, somebody took that from me. Somebody it. did, yeah, over the last yeah. like 10, 15 years, but for a while that, that record stood. Now, what uh, it seems like it's not something you necessarily want yeah, to talk it, about, it, it, but it was fine. Uh, yeah. Was it what, what was behind that story? I mean, was it something that just happened right away? We, uh, we were right playing, after kickoff, yeah, it was literally Colorado Rapids. Uh, we were playing at home in, in uh, Foxborough, and we, we warmed up and we went inside to you know, kind of like 15 minutes before you come back out. And in the interim, there's you know, the shower happened, it rained, so we come back out, and the field conditions have changed, right? And um, literally a minute or two in, the balls played over the top. And I, I was a guy who played on the like, I was kind of like the, a sweeper keeper. So the ball was played over, I came off my line and the ball bounced and I was about to volley it and it just skipped and took off. So I just handled the ball because so, it stopped the, the striker from scoring and um, so I got red card. Which my father had flown all the way across to come and watch the game from Israel. My dad was born. He comes and he's there and I get sent off and I had to miss the next game so he didn't, he, oh, was, wow. he wasn't too happy. I bet that's something it's tough. he's yeah. still reminded <laughs> of. He does, regularly. <laughs> Did you have, did you move to Boston uh, oh, yeah, for that yeah. season? Mm-hmm. And so I mean that was the first time. Then you had, had you left Carolina a whole bunch aside from maybe yeah. some road trips here and there playing. Um, pretty much, I've been in the Carolinas yeah. the whole time. Yeah, yeah. Was that I mean was that a different world up there in the in that the was Northeast? Great. Imagine or? being I mean I'm Irish. You know, my yeah. parents you know playing a pro sport in Boston. It was, it was, um, it was, it was, it was really good. It was great, and it was an excitement. You know, we're getting big crowd. I think we averaged about twenty twenty seven thousand a game. I mean it was. It was, um, yeah, it was really enjoyable, enjoyable time. And, you know, but the highs and lows, you know, I ended up, coach got fired. New coach came in, I got fired. I mean, it was, you know, sports happens, right? So, but uh, I wouldn't change it. I mean, I left a great job at Carolina to take that opportunity, but if I had to do it again, I would do it again for sure. Well, then did you end up spending then the next year with another MLS team? I I actually came back to the Dynamo uh, in Greensboro and I was playing with them. and I finished one more season, I think, with them. And then I actually went and became an assistant coach at Penn State. So I went there for two years. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, two years up at Penn State. And then I was offered the uh, job at Appalachian State as the head coach and spent two years there. So then once you kind of get into coaching full time, early in your coaching career, was there still kind of that bug to go back and play? Or was it kind of you made that transition and were just comfortable going full time into coaching? Yeah, I, I was. I think at that time, I think I was twenty seven. I was still young, right? But but I also knew my limitations. You know, I'd, I'd, after I'd been let go by New England, I would I spent went to two or three clubs. I would be, I would fill in. You know, if someone went on a national team, you know, I'd go to Columbus or I'd go to Tampa and fly down and sit on the bench. It was, and I was like, you know, I, I knew I was going to be a backup or maybe I get some minutes somewhere. And, you know, I wasn't the, the guy thinking I'm, I'm I'm the guy, and I just knew that you know, listen, I don't want to keep chasing that and moving around and bouncing around. I I, I felt like I wanted to get some stability, so it wasn't it wasn't as hard a, a decision to make as maybe you know I get caught and you miss playing off naturally, but um, for me it was you know it seemed like the right time. So you'd been an assistant for a short period of time at at Chapel Hill. You end up at Penn State. Mm-hmm. Is that where you start thinking, you know, this is your kind of, this is your career path and, yeah. you know, where you want to end up and all that kind of stuff? It was, yeah, yeah. And that was, you know, I think coaching's always been something I, even again, you know, what I took a coaching course when I was that young and I, and I was thought, well, why did I do it? There wasn't many people doing that, you know, and I think I just, I just loved the game so much. I knew I was going to be, continue to be involved either playing or in some capacity. So that was, yeah, definitely my, my kind of thought was to, to be a head coach somewhere. Did you want to end up back in North Carolina, or did you have you know kind of yeah the opportunities where you know wherever it would take you? Yeah, no, I I did. I thought um, North Carolina. It wasn't you know again if I, if I hadn't taken the app job, I could have ended up somewhere else. It wasn't that North Carolina was the pool, but you know it was it was I, I, again you know initially I'm not, you know coming in and like I said the warmth of everybody when I first arrived and you know it's a great state and and wonderful people. So um, yeah, it's. But it wasn't like I have to get back. It was the, the way it worked out with the, the position was was available, and, and um, yeah, so that's how I ended up at, back in the Carolinas. And then obviously UNCW job opens up, and I mean that was nineteen twenty years ago at this yeah. point. And I mean, 
I love Wilmington. I'm sure you know you probably had opportunities to go elsewhere. But you, you're been, you're yeah. here. You're a UNCW guy. What's it? You know, what's that mean to you? Yeah, I think you're right. I've had opportunities, but uh, you know, I've got a young family. I love I love um, you know what the this community has, and it's a great place to raise a family. And you know, I really feel like we we've we've, uh, we've made a lot of strides with that program, and, and it's been really cool to have that opportunity to kind of build build something and something we're proud of. And um, I still feel like there's a lot more we can do. So um, we're, we're we're still very very ambitious to. To, to do even better than we're doing right now, so yeah, it's it's uh, it's a work in progress, and, and uh, but but certainly Wilmington is a is dear near and dear to my wife and, and I's heart. Well, and it's kind of something, <clears throat> excuse me, you experienced as a player yourself in the late '80s in Charlotte, mm-hmm. to where now you come here and are part of building a program, yeah. taking a team to their first NCAA tournament appearance. What were some of the similarities and things that when you started building this program and getting it to where it is now that you were comfortable with and kind of realized that, okay, this is going to happen, this is something we need to do? I think, one, you got to establish the culture and change it. I mean, when I, when I first got here, it was um, it was a lot of players who liked to play soccer, but they weren't that committed and they wanted to to, to have the fun and they wanted to be you know just it was a very very laissez-faire and um, you know so the change in the mentality change changing the, the the way you know we have to work to be successful was was really establishing that first and then you got to get good players so I mean good players want to play with good players and um, you know if you if you don't have a lot of talent it's tough to win games so coaching is one thing but bringing in and continue to try and improve and bring in talent is, is important but they've also got to buy into, um, you know, what what our standards are and what the expectations are. And uh, so I'm I'm a, I'm a big I'm a big believer in, in making sure that the environment's the correct one, and you've got a chance of success if you if you do get that right. You talk about bringing in talent. I mean, after hearing your background, I mean, you must know better than anyone the different options that kids have out there as far as you know playing soccer. You talked about signing with Newcastle when you were 16. Mm-hmm. Probably not a lot of American kids have that really as an option, but obviously yeah. uh, you bring in a lot of kids from overseas, so they have those different options. Uh, you know, do you bring that up, you know, your kind of background when you're talking to kids about potentially coming here? No, I mean, it, you know, there's a lot of kids who want to come and they want to try that. You know, you hear a lot that I, I want to be a professional soccer player. Well, you know, they don't really know, right? I mean, it's, you know, hey, let's be good at, let's be a really good college soccer player first, and then, you know, then let's talk about the pro pro potential, pro opportunities. Um, I've had a lot of doors, I've had a lot of hurdles, you know. I haven't, I haven't, it's not been smooth sailing for, for me and, and, and as, a, as a player, for sure. Um, but yeah, you try and get in those kids who, we, we want the talented players that have got the potential to do that, but they, there's, there's a lot of work that's gonna have to go in. Uh, and if they do put the work in and they do keep improving and, and they're successful, then by all means, I think, you know, we've got a good network and have a lot of contacts that can could open up some doors potentially, like give them some opportunities, but then the rest is going to be up to them. Um, so I think I think coming here, we've I've always tried to get the best North Carolina players we can. You know, I, I'm very fortunate that I had an opportunity to come over and, to the states, but I, I wouldn't certainly try to mold my team and let's get foreigners and we'll fill it in with. You know, it's the other way around. We want to try and get the best North Carolina kids possible, and if we can't, then we we obviously look elsewhere. And, I think it's also trying. You know, you do have to find some some areas where you have a you know pipeline of kids coming in. You know, we've had some good Texas kids over the years, and um, so yeah, it, it's you know it's just trying to establish the where you can get in. You know, but they've got to be good players, but they've got to be good kids. They've got to be good students, good character guys, and <clears throat> that's maybe sounds a cliche, but it's not. It's it's very much what we try and live. Well, and it's got to be tough getting good North Carolina kids when you're recruiting against the likes of Chapel Hill, Duke, all these schools that have really good soccer programs here in the state. What is that like and what are some of the challenges you face when trying to get those kids to stay in the state and specifically come here to the beach? You do. I'm sure Randy you know, has similar, Randy Hood with, with baseball has similar challenges with, with, you know, there's a lot of competition and uh, there's a lot of really good programs, good universities in, in this area. We try and find the kids who there's a lot of kids who go to Carolina. I've been there, so I know I know the other side of it. There's a lot of kids who go there and they they get over recruited or they they sit on the bench and they may have a good experience. But I want the kids who are who are ambitious and want to play. And 
we want kids who want to come in and help us beat those guys. And if, if that's the kind of message, and we've had, you know, you, you, and you go statistically and look back, and we've had North Carolina kids who come in, and we've been able to get more of those kids because they see, all right, well, such and such came from my club. He played, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, he could have gone to Carolina. Would he have played? Possibly. But, you know, again, and I'm not saying there's any guarantees that coming to UNCW, you're a shoe in but we're going to give you the opportunity and the re- what you do with it is up to you. And, and we want those ambitious kids who maybe maybe they didn't get recruited by those teams or didn't get recruited that hard, you know, then they've got a chip on the shoulder, whatever it is. But we want some kids who are motivated and, and ambitious to, to, be, uh, to be on the field. And you talk about the opportunity to play in those schools. I mean... UNCW's had a lot of success, especially recently in the last few years, uh, having some high-profile midweek games. You know, kind of getting up there in the in the rankings. I mean, that's got to uh, you know help bring some of those kids into the program. It does. It does. You know, I mean, they want to play in those games, and we want to play those games. So, um, are you going to win every one? No, uh, but if you can win some of them, which we have, um, I think that's that's. That gives you a, certainly from an NCAA tournament and an RPI standpoint is very very helpful. But yeah, from a recruiting standpoint, we want those guys. The guys want to play in those games, you know. So uh, we're happy to to do it when they'll play us. Right. So <laughs> that's, I mean, that's got to be part of the equation as yeah. well as yeah, you know. some teams then in the ACC won't won't uh, won't play us. So we, I guess you're a little bit of a victim of your own success. And, yeah. and um, but then there's others who will, and we'll, we'll obviously keep trying to play them. Yeah, you've got. I mean, even mid-major programs in the area, Campbell and Coastal mm-hmm. and Charlotte and Greensboro, have had tremendous success yeah. in recent memory. But so, talk about the last three years. You know, two NCAA appearances. Last year was the regular season conference championship. I mean, just a heartbreaking yeah. loss in double overtime. That I mean, beautiful shot, by James Madison. Uh, you know, you talked about some of the loftier expectations here. I mean, with the that recent history, I mean, your goal has got to be. You know, getting deep in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, no? it is. It is, and and um, you know, we had a really special group. Uh, 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 this, this this last year was not that we haven't had good groups before, but as far as talent wise, um, balance in the team, um, mindsets, you know, work ethic, all the all the things you would like. You know, we it just shows you how fine a line it is, right? I mean, we we win the regular season, so you. You know, you've won the, the body of work. You're the best team in the league, and then you go to play in a final, and and a referee makes a decision that's wrong, and and you get a player sent off. Um, so you play with ten men. I couldn't tell you how proud I was of my guys playing with ten men and playing the way we did. To be able to do that at that stage of the season was was you know, super impressive. One of the more um, <clears throat> impressive performances, I would say, that I've I've seen from my groups over the years. But uh, you know, it wasn't meant to be. But but yeah, no, it, it it is. I mean, I think you know, again, you're in a really good region. So to go deep in the NCAA, you have to you have to beat the Virginias. You have to beat the the Wake Forest. You're going to have to fight and you know, get over that that hurdle, which is not easy. Um, so we've always had to face that. But yeah, but it's it's definitely a goal of ours. When you talk about, I think last season, you know, the RPI just wasn't there like it was in the previous mm-hmm. two seasons. You didn't win the conference tournament yeah. the previous two seasons either, and it's just, you know, victim of scheduling. You just didn't have the right teams on the schedule, and just didn't have the right wins against Correct. those teams. Correct. You know, we um, we had a, a rough opening weekend. We played very well in preseason, and then we had a really uh, surprisingly we lost two games in the yeah. opening game. Not not that we were, the teams we played were poor. We played Georgia Southern and Stetson, but we just made some really silly mistakes, which wasn't was uncharacteristic. But then other games, you know, UNC had a down year. Um, you know, we had some other games. Um, you know, some other teams like an Old Dominion, who they're usually an NCAA tournament team, and they just had their worst year in, in, in a long, long time. So those things didn't help us. <clears throat> but again, that's you know, we're not crying about it. It was, it was um, at the end of the day, you got to win your games, and, and um, unfortunately, we didn't win enough of them. But no, it was, it was a uh, tremendously proud of those guys, and um, obviously, you know, from from. The ones that moved on, they're doing they're doing quite well. Well, you mentioned some of the talent too, to where, you know, I feel like it's kind of been you're going into your twentieth season here as coach, and you mentioned that probably one of the more talented teams you just had was this past team. Yep. Is that something that's kind of been a work in progress to where it's almost taken this long to get to where you wanna be really with the talent, with the success? Has it been a building process that's kind of led up to this and now 
Is it something that you can kind of sustain if you can continue to get those kids to yeah, buy in and I mean, come? It's a million dollar question, right? I mean, I, I would hate to think it's been 20 years because I think that would really, it wouldn't say, speak well of the really good teams and good players we've had beforehand. I think it's just in cycles and it, it's, it, I mean, it, 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 you know, maybe one year it's slightly better and one year, you know, there are teams who maybe weren't as talented, they've won more games or have, have won and, 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 and a CA championship. It's, it's um, sometimes it's just circumstances and, and situations, and but no, I I, I think we're in a, in a you know our, our goal is to again bring in kids every year who are going to be bought into what we're doing, and um, you know the wins and losses sometimes you know it, it's out of your control a little bit, but I think we'll always be there or thereabouts, and and um, you know I, I really like the types of guys we got in the group right now. And, and the squad, and we feel like we've recruited some some good ones to join them. So, you know, our expectation is to keep you know, always keep pushing. And um, will we reach the heights, or play as well, or play as good soccer as the team a year ago? We'll we'll certainly try, and and um, and maybe we'll try and do better. Well, and speaking of some of those players specifically, when you look at a guy like Philip Goodrum, mm -hmm. who you know leaves this school all over the record books did a lot of great things while he was here. We actually had him on last year, mm -hmm. and he talked about kind of his pro aspirations, and he wasn't quite done with what he wanted to do here at that time. Yeah. But now, looking back into now, where he's part of an MLS franchise, and then Reynolds, Lindstrom, guys that were all on the team last year that are all yeah. going pro now, that's got to be beneficial for you and the program as a whole when kids see that and say, okay, I can go to UNCW and get to the next level. It is, it is, and and, and if a, if a kid's looking at, it, they should they should see that, and 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 you know it's, that could be a good uh, a good decision to come to a place like ours. Um, so yeah, and again, it, it, you know, we, we, we 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 you don't always know, right? When you're in the recruiting process, you can see the talent. You try to get to know the kids, but I mean, just what's their inner drive? And those guys were incredibly driven and motivated. Um, you know, I, talk, I texted with Phil last week, and he's like, "Hey, thanks for everything you did for me." I was like, "Phil, if I had, you know, people as as uh, with the same attitude as you, make my job be so much easier." I mean, every kid, because he was, you know, just a, a joy to, to to coach and be around because you know there was no excuses. The work he put in to to become good, you know, he deserves everything that uh, is going to come his way. And you know, he's still got a ways to go. Of course, he's on the first rung of the pros, but. Um, I was laughing because you know last week he was playing on he was on the bench down in Honduras, and I was laughing. I said, "Well, we you know going from playing Presbyterian at Wingate to being against Matagua down in Honduras is is quite a, quite a change from what he was he was doing you know within a year." So I'm tremendously proud of him, and, and um, you know I'm, I'm looking forward to more good things happening for him. Well, like you said, you've had a lot of guys come through here. You know, Phil and Danny aren't the first guys to get drafted out of UNCW, yeah. and and Mark's not the first guy to sign a you know a pro contract out of UNCW. You know, like you said in your professional career, things happen and guys end up in different places for different reasons. Do you have a lot of those guys coming back here to Wilmington and uh, interacting with the team at all, kind of bringing some of that pro expertise back down to Wilmington? Yeah, I mean, uh, Brad Knighton's been great. I mean, he's um, you know we've we've he's had him come back and stay uh, or not stay come back and meet with the team and answer questions and. Um, he's been incredibly great with his time. Um, you know, when we go up to, to Northeastern, he's there. He's in the locker room. He's getting guys. For, you know, he's he's just part of. It. He's he's really a. He's pr tremendously proud of, of being at UNCW. But you know, for him to pass on, and he's willing to share those experiences and and help um, help some of our guys. <clears throat> you know, if they have questions, he's, he's been uh, tremendous. So yeah, you know, we do, and, and I love it when. I hear from former players, or you know, get a phone call, or so they, they they come back to campus. I think it's, I think that's that's one of the really fun things, most enjoyable things about being a coach. I think it helps build the culture too. You know, it when, does. You, when you're a, a, you know 18 year old freshman, and you know, here's a career MLSer now that mm -hmm. was in your shoes, you know, yep. 15, 20 years ago. I mean, that's got to be absolutely a pretty cool feeling and definitely inspirational. For sure, for sure, and he's uh, he'll come back and train with us from time to time when he's when he's able. So it's uh, you know those things are. Uh, a really good priceless for our guys. Well, Brad was just inducted into the UNCW Hall of Fame back in 2018 and actually came back and got his degree again, I believe, as well. Did, yeah. Right? Yeah. So when you see a guy like Brad, too, because that was kind of earlier when you first got to UNCW in your first few years, 
when you look at the success he had, and then specifically he was a goalie as well, mm -hmm. was that something that right away when you first got here was something that you were going to be able to focus on being that you were a goalie yourself? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, I'm, I'm still training with goalkeepers now. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't know how many Division One coaches are doing that. And I don't know, you know, I have to work out to make sure I can still fire balls and serve balls. But, uh, you know, that was one of the reasons Brad came here because he knew he was going to get special attention and, and uh, try and help him. And, so I think that was, you know, he was, he was, you know, that was calculated decision on his part, and, and thankfully it worked out for him, and thankfully it worked out for us. Absolutely. Well, a lot of great goalkeepers over the years. Yeah, we had, we had some yeah. really good ones. Yeah. Well, and he was kind of at the forefront of that in the beginning of your yeah. coaching career, to where, I mean, I think that laid a foundation, and I mean, you could kind of attest to that with what you do as a coach mm -hmm. with individuals, but then kind of the overall picture too, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure, and. and um, you know we have we've had some really good ones over the years and and um, you know I take I do take pride in, in those guys being you know if you don't have a good goalkeeper you're not going to win too much absolutely unless you're a 42 year old Zamboni driver right it's good Play, yeah playing in the NHL <laughs> then what a great yeah. story well is he welcome back in Toronto though I wonder Cause... I think so he got a standing <laughs> ovation at the end of the yeah yeah Res they, they, you know respect the game up, in, for, up there right? for sure but then maybe. Going into kind of where the roster is today, I mean, obviously you've you've kind of you've lost some firepower. But one thing I've noticed about UNCW is, especially with with the men's soccer team, is you kind of, you guys kind of always retool, reload, mm -hmm. and are right back into contention the next year. So yeah. I mean, I think it's seven years now in a row you guys haven't finished. I think one season where you finished lower than third in the conference. Mm -hmm. um, one season that was five hundred, but positive on the wins every year over the last seven to where you've kind of built something now that seems sustainable. Tell me where you guys are currently today. Obviously, the spring season has kind of kicked off and yeah. you've got three or four more games, I believe, for the spring season. But tell me where you guys are today and kind of what are some reasonable expectations for kind of a young group you got coming in, yeah. too. Yeah, I mean, listen, you, you, I think it goes back to again. What are the what are the expectations of uh, you know? Do we are we going to say well we're just not going to be good next year? No, no. I think that's you know we we have we try and recruit the best talent of the kids we can, but we bring them in. I mean I'm I'm very pleased with how our group's working at the moment. Their attitude. Um, what does that translate to as far as wins and losses? We we don't know. We don't know what the competition how they how good they're going to be. But I will tell you, um, we got some exciting pieces. So. Um, you know, that's not. We're not looking in the rearview mirror. We're looking forward, and, and uh, you know, those guys are going to help us be good again. And, and that's the uh, that's the that's the expectation from from me. Not uh, and if that, uh, what does that mean for you know? We're we going to have thirteen wins. We're we going to have ten wins. Seven. Uh, you know, again, it's it's. Um, I don't worry about that. That's not how you approach. You know, you know, we're just trying to get a little bit better each and every day, and and, and we're seeing that happen. Well, and from everything you've said, it's kind of a kind of cross that bridge when it comes, but as long as your guys are prepared, have the right state of mind, and are doing what you need them to do, it'll kind of lead to those other things. Sure, yeah, if you're doing the right things, I mean, you know, you're gonna have, uh, you're gonna have good rewards or good success, and, and uh, you know, we preach that a lot, and, and, um, and that's not just about the training, it's the lifestyle habits, their sleep, their recovery, their, their diet, I mean, all these things that, that need, to, if they wanna be a top player, and a lot of them wanna be, that's what you have to do. Well, and for a coach, too, and, and you can kind of give me, please give me your opinion on this, is when it comes to coaching, it's, it's if you don't focus about the here and now and your team and your guys mm -hmm. and you get caught up in the future and other teams, that's when you kind of don't really have success. Is that Could that be Very much, yeah. a fair statement? Yeah. I think it's an indictment to the players that you have if you're worried about or continue thinking about the next guy, the next guy, the next guy, you know. Of course, you got to keep an eye on that and recruiting, and you know who do, who's going to be graduating, who's going to who, who's going to you know what needs we're going to have. But you've got to spend the time, and you've got to invest the time in the current players. You know they're intelligent. You know they know if you're not prepared or you are not doing what you you know have, and the attention's not there on them. They they get it, and you know they've got to feel uh, that you're their priority, and that's that's the way it has to be. You've got, you know, it's kind of a short regular season that NCAA soccer has kind of end of August through November 17th was the last game you guys played last season. 
you've got about a two month window here in the spring, I guess, where you actually play some scrimmage games and whatnot. You know, what happens between the end of the regular season coming up to the spring season and then through the summer? What's that, you know, year round schedule look like for you know, NCAA yeah, Division you know, you think we and finish in November, and then that's like we'll see you guys in January. Yeah, you know, they, they, um, you know, we do, we, we get some of those guys get back in the weight room pretty quick, quickly. Um, some, you know, we want them to take a little bit of time off to recuperate, um, and then you're pretty much in the exam. So, you know, that, but we give them a workout for the for the for the Christmas time, uh, for the break, and then when they come back, we start day one. You know, we, we're in the gym first first day of school. We were in the gym um, so like beginning of January. Beginning of January. Yeah, January 14th this year. Um, and then we had about a month where we have eight hours a week of training, and that includes conditioning. So we were doing four hours a week of ball work. Um, and now we're into our 20 hours a week, and we can play games. So um, so that's that's kind of the schedule now until mid-April. Right. And then the guys will finish and uh, finish off with exams. A lot of guys play throughout the summer, summer as well. Yeah, yeah. We, we, a, a bunch of the guys will go and play. It's called a PDL, Professional mm -hmm. Development League. So they'll go and and, um, and then some will try and send out to clubs um, to get a, maybe go and train for a week somewhere. Phil went to six clubs last summer, you know. So he got his face out there and was able to train. And he got him with the first team, and you know, Lando was that's kind of where he impressed, and, and that helped him get drafted. Let's, uh, you know, just real quick. Uh, so you've got a, a, a decent home slate here in the spring, yeah. right? You've got uh, Lewisburg, Wingate, Coastal, and then. Let's talk a little bit about, I mean, something I think, you know, you kind of brought to this university, something real special to you. Yeah. Uh, every year, Harry's game. Mm -hmm. uh, this year is High Point. You know, Harry's your son. Talk a little bit about Harry and, and, and the game. Yeah, you know, we've, we, my wife and I, uh, Harry was born, he's going to be eight this year. Um, Harry was born with Down syndrome. And, uh, you know, we, we knew that in, you know, going through the, the pregnancy and um, didn't really know anything, you know, we hadn't had much interaction with with uh, or experience with or knowledge of um, you know, kids with disabilities or uh, sp uh, special needs and, and um, so Harry came into our world and, and um, you know we've we've uh, it's been a just a, a an awesome little lad look and uh, he's um, you know he's nonverbal and, and uh, you know he's, he's um, he has some challenges for sure but it, it kind of made us realize you know we're all dealing with stuff right we're all we're all having to deal with different you know, challenges here or there, you know, be it with intellectual disabilities or kids with autism or, you know, CP or, and w the idea I mean, was, was to just have a game to just to promote awareness, not, not, not promote Harry, but pro promote awareness for, you know, uh, for our child and, and people who have children or, or adults who are older with, with, with special challenges. And um, so we try to do that and raise a little bit of money in, this, in the process to give to local charities. and. Um, yeah, we really enjoy it. You know, it's 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 fun. We do a little clinic with it beforehand, and you know, we have bounce houses, and the kids come out of this food and they try to make it best. Yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. Good time. yeah. So we've we've had some really good teams. We've always played. Uh, you know, we we've, we've never lost a Harry game. That's what I was gonna say. You guys have yeah. had some success at them. Yeah, so. no, it's it's usually a good culmination to the end of our spring season. So um, we we'll look forward to it. And then kind of just jumping back into just soccer in general right to where now that you've been in the states you 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 have been fully engulfed in how the recruiting process is how youth soccer is how you get from youth soccer AAU soccer to college soccer then to MLS or overseas talk about some of the differences from Europe and how youth soccer is compared to how it is in America and maybe some things that we could do to maybe improve some of those issues that I think a lot of American soccer players that are really talented feel like they're kind of behind the eight ball at times. Well, it, it, you know, it's such a, uh, there's so many pieces to that question. You know, there's so many challenges that we have that we don't have in, in Europe. Um, one is accessibility. You know, we, you know, I remember I didn't have my parents. I would walk along the street and go and and play you know the field down the road you know I wasn't having to get picked up and dropped off and moved from you know to drive 30 minutes to a, to a practice or you know, stuff that we have to, to, to deal with in, in, in a country the size of ours um, so that's one one two is again the cost you know there's there's, there's um, typically go growing up when there wasn't a charge to or a fee to play um, for, excuse me for your teams and 
you know, in, 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 in this country, it's unless you're with an MLS academy, um, you know, there's there's a cost involved, and um, so that can be that can be a challenge as well. But really, it, it's you know, I think we've come a long, long way. You know, it's been really uh, for me to be kind of in that whole process of seeing where we were and where we've, we've come to. I think everyone looks at the national team and says, you know, that's the you know that's got to be the, the the kind of shining light and the beacon, and that's going to be a reflection of how the game is going. I, I get that, but I think we've also made some missteps there as well with with you know, certain areas. So, but you look at some of the talent coming through. Um, you know, heck, I mean, you know, Pulisic's playing in, in, in you know, for the Chelsea's and you know West McKinney and the German Bundesliga. And so there's, have you look at some of the talent that's coming through? I mean, <clears throat> again, it's cycle though. I think you're going to have. The national team's going to do really well sometimes, and then there's going to be some years where, you know, it's, that was, you know, not making the World Cup was was devastating, right? We should have been yeah. there, but we 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 blew it. And uh, but if I look and go and say, well, is the game, you know, is it is it getting it? You look at it, the success of MLS, you look at the crowds, you know, the games, the games continually improving, and, and we're getting better at what we're doing, and and um, hopefully that translates to to a World Cup in, in my lifetime. I don't know, we'll see. Do you think part of it, too, because I always look at it as soccer isn't necessarily the popular sport in America. Do you think that plays a, a big part in it, too, to where kids growing up, you're watching basketball on TV. It's very easy to see a football game, mm -hmm. a baseball game. Is is that part of it, too, to where it's just not exposed and, and given to kids at an early age to where they have a passion for something else before they're even introduced to soccer? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, for sure. I mean... Um you know, but again, they have other challenges too, right? I mean, you know, I'm a parent, and I don't, want, I wouldn't want my child playing football. I like American football, like yeah. watching it, but it's not something I think is would be that, you know, great for my for my kid. I'd be too excited to play. But you know, as as more and more people, or more and more, you know, families or my guys are graduating and they're having families, you know, we're gonna soccer is gonna be more, you know, they're gonna be more involved, and that's, that's gonna be their sport of choice. And, uh, I really enjoy the other sports as well. I think they've got a lot of merit, and, and kids have options, and being able to play a variety of sports can be helpful. And but then, uh, yeah, I, I, I think with that growth and the, the sheer numbers, the, the, the talent levels should improve or should get better. Yeah, I can attest to the football thing too, because my, my the one sport my son does play right now is soccer. Yeah, he's six, six years old. <laughs> he's six years old. So, but yeah, ten years on the recruiting trip, maybe. Yeah, may, maybe. Well, he's local, so you won't have to go far to see him. That's good. I'll come and watch. Well, just real briefly about, you know, kind of local soccer. You know, for a, lar a large time there, you know, there was a pro team here in Wilmington. Uh, you know, you guys obviously had a, a pretty close relationship yeah. with them, and they, you know, for various reasons, they're not here anymore. They still have, though, the youth soccer program, which is huge here in Wilmington. Mm -hmm. Just talk a little bit about maybe the history of, your uh, relationship with the Hammerheads, uh, both professionally and with the youth side. Yeah, both. I mean, we've we've, we've always been supportive. Um, you know, I think it was it was I really enjoyed it when the Hammerheads were here. I think something in the summer for the families to go to and, and a, a sporting event. Um, you know, I get it. it. You know, it's financially it was it could be quite pricey to to, to have to, to foot the bill for a, for a team in a league like uh, the USL. Or, um, so. Yeah, but you know, I think the the guys at the the Wilmington Hammerheads Youth are doing a, a very good job. Um, you know, both my staff, you know, are, are involved with that. I have kids in the club. Um, you know, I try and help out as much as I can around family stuff. So, um, yeah, it, it's it's. Um, I think it's some players. We picked up a couple of guys. We picked up one this year, Philip Speed, who plays in the club. Um, so if we can develop some kids locally, and 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 you know, it's 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 been a win win for all of us. So yeah, but uh, it's you know there's there's some uh, there's some really good kids coming through and, and uh, you know they're they're, they're going to expand the soccer park out there um, so there'll be more opportunities and more more places for kids to play so I'm I'm uh, I'm all in favour. Yeah, that that outreach program I actually work with Kim Crab and yeah, well, do a lot with her and that's she does where a my phenomenal job. absolutely and that's where my son plays too but there's a lot of talent mm -hmm. in that youth group I mean. There's kids that stand out every weekend that I can yeah. look at and say, you know what, if he has the right guidance, keeps his head down, he'll be playing college soccer yeah. one day. Yeah, absolutely. So it's kind of beyond, right? Yeah, yeah exactly, true. exactly. And I know a lot of those kids too. One thing that Kim does when you talk about the 
how it how it uh, the access to it is difficult. You know, trying. You know, if you got a kid that lives in Leland, that their family can't necessarily afford to travel back and forth every weekend, mm-hmm. stuff like that. That's that's one thing that Kim is really proactive in yeah. in making I sure that every kids. kid has an opportunity yeah. to get down there to play. Has cleats. Has uh, shin guards. Has shorts. Has a jersey. Like it's. Yeah. That was something that drew me to it and why I've, I've been invested in it myself and my family for the last two or three years is because of how dedicated and strong she is with it. Like, it's yeah. just, yeah, she's it's like amazing. She's like Piper. She's, it, she's incredible. <laughs> exactly. You're exactly right. But, um, yeah, and then maybe kind of just to touch on the team this season now, going into this season we mentioned the spring schedule. Talk about a couple guys specifically that you can't wait to see get on the field in a game situation. Like some guys that maybe some of those new guys you mentioned, Philip Speed coming in, mm-hmm. some of those guys even returning that now that there's some of those spots are open, you're going to need some guys to kind of take a bigger leadership role, yeah. take a more proactive role. Tell me who some of those guys are going to be this season. Yeah, I mean, we've, I think, uh, you know, we've had some guys, we played last weekend and, and uh, uh, against Apple and won 3-1 and, and uh, everybody played and it was good to uh, you know, get, a, get a handle on how some of those guys are coming along. So, um, you know, T was, T Berg was, was, was kind of him and Dom too and were really effective in midfield and um, I think Jacob Evans, who was injured last season, uh, felt like yeah, he played, but he wasn't one hundred percent healthy. I think he he could be a game changer for us. You know, Jalen Anderson's coming back from from a uh, broken ankle last season. You know, he didn't he, he was out with that, so um, you know he's come back. And um, Cannon Tootle and, and Parker uh, Parker Norris have, have really kind of been been having a good start of the spring. But you know, everyone's adding. I think we're looking at the back. You know, we lost some some defenders, so. Uh, Drew Rabel is an important piece. He's you know you know he's been uh, he's never Drew's always done a good job for us when he's played. Um, but yeah, Johan, we got brought a lad in from Sweden. He's coming back from an injury, so we're waiting for, to see how he does and, and get him into some some training, proper training and, and minutes. So yeah, you know those are the guys. You know, uh, like I said, I think the, the entire group have been been really putting a been a good work uh, workload in, and and then we'll see. You know, the new guys. You never really knew it until new guys, but we we do have some. Some interesting guys, I think, again, are going to should hopefully uh, give us a little bit of you know, kind of complementary guys in, in different spots. Um, so we'll see. It's going to be good. I think competition will be good in the fall. Well, and you mentioned Jacob Evans. That's, mm-hmm. that's another guy from England. Yeah. Right? So tell me what that relationship's like with, I know Danny was just here last year mm-hmm. as well, Reynolds, and he was also from that, that side of the pond. Tell me what that relationship is and kind of is it, is it almost easier for you to get some of those guys because they know they can relate to you? They can mm-hmm. they can talk about things that maybe they can't talk to with their teammates about or experiences, whether it's missing family, missing home. Mm-hmm. Is that something that's easier for you to do than to say, you know, an American coach that's never experienced anything outside uh, of this culture? I think it's a good question. Uh, you know, I think I had a special relationship with Danny. I don't think he had a, he'd been at Louisville and he wasn't didn't find it that rewarding. And I think you know we connected really, really well, uh, Jacob too. But it, it's not because they're from you know the same country. I, I really try and connect with with all the guys, and we meet with them individually every week, and um, you know try and make sure that we. When it's, it's just not about soccer. You know we need to know about uh, where what makes them tick and where they're from and their family and their backgrounds. And um, so yeah, but but again, you you, you do understand it. You know, there's some jokes, you, you know, some sense of humor yeah. you know, that maybe is different that I, I get and they get and maybe the mm-hmm. other guys don't. But, you know, I think, I think um, um, you know, we don't, going back to my previous point, you know, you, we have a certain amount of internationals, but we don't want to be so heavy with internationals, not that we could afford to, but, um, you know, that we want the majority to be Americans. And, and um, But I think it's good to have diversity in the team and from guys from different backgrounds and, you know, we brought Subasa in, who's a, a transfer, who's Japanese from from West Virginia. You know, it's another different. I, mean, I don't know how many guys have even you know been around a guy from Japan. Um, you know, so I think it's those are things I think are just culturally are good for you know just life skills life, as well, yeah. right? As well as you know become become good teammates. Well, yeah, you guys aren't Hofstra. I know Hofstra. That's kind of their roster. Yeah, they do. They is nothing. And and I've had conversations with um. Tom Reardon and different guys when it comes to that. Do you think that 
that gives other teams an advantage or even you guys a disadvantage when it comes to kind of the financing behind it and the funds available and, and, and that type of situation? Or do you just kind of, it is what it is, and you push through? Um, they're both. I mean, we're always trying to improve our scholarship allotment, which isn't the full you know, Division One complement. You know, you've got to be able to recruit guys, and if you don't have the same, it's, you know, it's, it's not a level playing field. So I think, um, but I'm also more so that the glass is half full and half empty. Um, you know, if I if I if I was unhappy with it and, and you know I was compl complaining about it and crying about it, then we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing. And um, so, but of course, you know, we, we do want to be able to to have enough to compete against the top schools, and we, we want to you know we've been in the top twenty five I don't know, every year for the last how many years, and, and um, that's not easy when you you got you got to when some of the schools have more. But it is, you know, it is, it is what it is to a degree, yeah, right? yeah. But um, we, we, we want to look more on the positive side. What is that allotment? The scholarship. Nine point nine. Nine point nine. And where are yeah. you guys at about? About eight and a half. Okay. Yeah. So. What about on the facility side? I mean, you know, especially in the CAA. I mean, I, I think UNCW Soccer Stadium, you know, pretty nice atmosphere, you know, decent field. But yeah. you know, you guys got the little practice field on the side. You mentioned you do some indoor work. Is there anything that could be better or worse, you know, about being here in Wilmington? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, just, you know, if you go around at, at the CAA, there's some, some really good um, facilities, and then you know, again, the schools will play. You know, I mean, Caroline is a bit of an anomaly because we went up there this year, and it was an incredible uh, stadium. That's you know, for Anson, you know, Anson Doran Stadium, and, and um, but no, I mean, you know, getting something out there would be, you know, we've got offices and locker rooms together, and and, and improve the. The, the playing surface. You guys dress at Trask and then walk. Yeah, over. yeah, and yeah. Sort of the visitors. Correct. As well. Correct. So that that's something I think there's plans to. Um, you know, again, financing for that is going to have to be raised. But I think there's plans to 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 look to to add a field house potentially in the future. Um, but yeah, you know, just make sure the, the the taking care of what we have for one, and then then make sure that the playing surface is the best it can be. The practice fields come a long way. You know, we did some extension and expansion of that, so it's a more re more uh, soccer specific size um, the surface Drew Hall and his staff do a wonderful job with the field so so yeah those things have improved so. and then maybe just kind of we lately we've been doing kind of some lighthearted stuff to end, end the interviews right so I know obviously soccer guy but after soccer what's Coach Haney's next sport uh, other than other than what's my favorite other than uh, yeah other than soccer Probably college basketball. Okay. So, over the years, then, obviously, before you got to UNCW, because we we know you're gonna say UNCW is your college team. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, who who would you follow, and who were some teams that you always kind of admired or enjoyed watching play? Uh, UNC basketball, because I was just you know yeah. there. I was there. Uh, I do like the NFL. I'm a Patriots fan. I know that's going to go down well. That makes everyone in this room. Well, but it makes sense, though. I mean, you spent spent a good chunk of time up there. Yeah, the, cra the crafts were our owners, so you kind of got the. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but that's that's probably it. If I, if I, you know, my wife's a Duke basketball fan, but she's so that was interesting when they play each other. Okay, so there's a little little in-house rivalry there. Yeah. Now, when you got to America back back in the '80s, what were some things that over those first five, ten years, or even longer? that Americanized you? Like things that some of your friends and family in England would see you doing now and be like, you know, what, what, what the hell are you doing? Tough question. Tough question. Um, one was not rollerblading. I'm just joking, I didn't rollerblade. <laughs> I, I rollerblade. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what did Americanize me? Just some of the some of the, 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 the vocabulary and language. You know, like, oh, you go home and you'd say like a, a word, they'd be like, Oh, that's so American. Like, yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, so, I've been there, yeah. Exactly. What about uh, food then for you? What are some some food items or even some local restaurants that Coach Haney can't live without? Well, salsa and chips. I love salsa and chips. So when I go overseas and I, you, you don't it's just just not the same. Yeah. Not the same. But I think Wilmington got some incredible restaurants, and we love we love going out and, and eating um, 
the Pinfish downtown is a fantastic restaurant. Um, you know, I really like uh, Ceviches, which is down near the beach. Um, I think it's just such a wide variety of, of places to, to go. But uh, yeah, I mean, um, heck, we went to Aromas of Peru, you know, last week. It's like you like these little gems that are mm -hmm. hidden that people don't know about. Yeah, they're they're all over. There's so many of them now down here. It's kind of, yeah. it's turning into a little foodie town. It is, it's great. And a craft beer town. Do you say y'all? I never say y'all. Never say y'all. Never say y'all. No. It'll come. I say you all. No, I don't. I don't. You, <laughs> you guys? You <laughs> <laughs> you and yeah, that, that too. I've heard that actually. Then uh, okay, what about music? Yeah, I love my music. What is on Coach Haney's playlist right now? Ooh, there's a guy. Um, there's a guy on tonight, uh, Dermot Kennedy. He's uh, playing up at the Ritz in Raleigh, which I wish I could go. I can't. He's an Irish uh, kind of singer. I know you're gonna look him up afterwards. Um, <laughs> Um, who do I like? Well, I have to like certain things for my for my daughters to be cool. Yeah, um, that's what I was gonna say. Your kids and and your got, team. Yeah. Last concert I went to was um, um, Justin Timberlake. Don't be don't be so quick to walk away. <laughs> uh, and we're gonna go and see Taylor Swift. Don't don't hate me for that. That's a daughter. Yeah. Daughter I pick. What can I say? Harry Styles coming no, up but I'm a, this I'm a, year? Huh? Harry Styles? Yeah, they'd be there in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah. They'd be in a heartbeat to see him if he, if, uh, you know, I think he's on in Atlanta. Um, but yeah, I like you too. And, you know, I grew up on like stuff that you wouldn't like, Depeche Mode. Oh, no. Like I, yeah. I'm actually... I'm, I'm old. Yeah, I'm, I'm old school when it comes to music. So yeah. I'm a big 80s rock fan. A lot of people probably wouldn't think that. Yeah. But Cars, Talking Heads. Oh, and, yeah. I'm a big 80s rock guy. But, uh, what about with your with the team though? Because I know it's got to be hard to throw on some U two, well, well you guys we're are practicing. The, uh, right? We're on the vans on the way back, and I let them have have a go of the. Uh, Trying to think, like, I like Kygo, bringing the Kygo, um, and the guys like that stuff. Um, I just hate. I don't. I'm not a rap fan, so when I put that, on, I'm like, no, that's off. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, with all the you know, you put it in the locker room, and I'm like, oh, well, yeah, tough. and I would think you got such a diverse yeah, Americans, group. Yeah, Europeans, you yeah, got, you know. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Yeah, that kind of maybe that that new EDM kind of that. I don't like like Griffin, like a DJ, you know, yeah. stuff like that. That's, that's yeah. and actually, yeah. I think that's I like that. Yeah, that's Jordan. Jordan knows Jordan. all about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm like the old man, you know, and they probably go, what the heck do, what do you, How do you know that? And I'm Did like, they play it too loud for you? No, I'm fine with that. I <laughs> yeah. like loud music, but it's when, the, it's when it's like, you know, I'm not into hearing swear words coming out of the locker room. Yeah. And yeah, it's what, it is what it is. Yeah. No, I, so. Nowadays, hip hop isn't, it just isn't the same. We had this conversation with Jake Boggs last week. Yeah. And he, uh, he dropped some 20 year old gems on us. Oh, yeah. So we'll, we'll say that. But, uh, yeah, it's, this has been great. We appreciate no having problem, you on. Guys, thanks any, for your time. You, appreciate the uh, patience. Oh, absolutely. Is there anything yeah, else you want to kind of touch on or shout out anybody, anything like that? That's... No, I'm good, man. I've got to go to the tax man now, so that's on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Put my tax meeting. Hopefully it works yeah. on your favor. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a lot more fun. Hopefully. Good luck with that. But um, Yeah, thanks for your time, guys. Appreciate your support. And, and um, let's uh, look for big things again this coming fall. Absolutely. Looking we'll definitely all we'll all be out there. We appreciate you coming on. This was uh Coach Haney, Aiden Haney of the UNCW men's soccer team. Thanks for joining us. It's been real. Thanks for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. And don't forget to check out our other Hawkstream episodes and our other Hawkstream podcasts, like the Military Podcast, or Talk Hollywood to Me, or Let's Get Koozy. Or if you want to check out some music from around the area, Music at the Dub.